I want to echo the thanks to the organizers, the individuals and institutions that brought us all together in such a beautiful place. Thank you. Seminole and Muscogee Nation filmmaker Sterling Harjo's Reservation Dogs, produced for Hulu FX over three seasons from 2021 to 2023, is the indigenous television show that so much of us, so many of us have been waiting for with its all-native writer's room, nearly all-native cast, including cast and crew from his own nations, as well as others from the 39 indigenous nations of Oklahoma. Many of the actors working on Reservation Dogs, John Proudstar, Richard Whiteman, Tamara Pademski, uh, Casey Camp Hornegg, and others, also appeared in his first Sundance Festival short film, Goodnight Irene, in 2005, and or his first two feature films, Four Sheets to the Wind, in 2007, and Barking Water, in 2009. You can scroll through three slides there of those films. One of the hallmarks of Harjo's filmmaking and his work with actors is his attention to older generations in his Oklahoma indigenous communities. He describes in an interview how, quote, when I was a kid, I would always listen to people, older people talk, and I was always the one that would ask older people to retell stories that I had already heard. It wasn't the story that I wanted, it was how they told it. His close study from an early age to, quote, the different ways people tell stories. Sometimes they lie, sometimes they stretch the truth, or sometimes they leave things out, unquote, has lent his films the cadence and style of central Oklahoma's native towns, ways of speaking, social ways of being that are unique, especially to older bilingual Seminole and Muscogee language speakers. Harjo's creative vision is coherent across his films over time returning to develop the same characters over several productions and drawing on this group of Oklahoma-based indigenous actors who have worked with him for almost two decades. While other directors have had long-standing working relationships with individual actors or groups of actors, like that's common, what's unique in Harjo's case is the way this ongoing collaboration in an industry that has historically excluded indigenous peoples from opportunities for such relationships enacts specifically indigenous values of relationality that mark his on-screen aesthetics as well. These collaborations have produced a composite long-form storyline with recurring characters and settings. And I argue here that this repetition, an on and off-screen aesthetics of reprise, supports an activist recentering of indigenous conceptions of citizenship and kinship in service of political sovereignty and instantiation of indigenous media studies foundational theorization of visual sovereignty. And there are other scholars as well I could cite, there could be a couple of pages on this concept. Harjo's collaboration with Casey Camp Horanak, for example, extends from his first short film, Goodnight Irene, in 2005, through all the way to his current hit, Reservation Dogs, which uh, ended just last summer after three seasons. Camp Horanak, is a lifelong native rights and environmental activist, as well as an actress. She's a tradition bearer for the Ponca Nation, working to carry forward knowledge and cultural identity as a drum keeper for the uh, nation's Pathata, or Women's Scalp Bench Society. She played the lead role of Irene Harjo, a seminal elder in Goodnight Irene, which is set entirely in the waiting room of an Indian Health Service, or IHS, clinic. Um, and that's part of the way the clinic is introduced, which is, an image, I think, of settler colonial austerity. <laughs> we, could, we could assume. Um, okay, so Kim Pornick's performance of a native elder, her gentle manner, her very effective management of the somewhat misbehaved men seated next to her. Um, for the next one and the next one. Um, her sly seminal language jokes and her sovereigntist activism anchor this poem, which depicts intergenerational relationships and the impending loss of beloved elders. She reprises the character in Harjo's 2009 feature film, Barking Water, and in 2021, she returns again as Irene in an episode of Reservation Dogs that also features several scenes in the IHS waiting room. And if you've seen the show, you know that's episode two of that first season. I connect Harjo and Camp Horanek's collaboration and recursive aesthetics 
to strategies of on and off screen relationality with the waiting room as a space in which the character of Irene conveys the activist ethics of community responsibility shared by actor Camp Horonet, who regularly speaks against extractive industries that have poisoned formerly pristine rivers running through Ponca lands in Oklahoma. Even as Harjo's characters are subjected to imposed bureaucratic definitions of indigenous identity, their connection in the IHS waiting rooms of Goodnight Irene and Reservation Dogs reestablishes kinship beyond the strictly biological to comprise relationships grounded in that shared responsibility. As they discard the documents of bureaucratized identity for this more expansive kinship, they become activists led by Camp Hornet's ethos of mutual caretaking and mutual guardianship. So the film's thesis connects Irene's ethos kinship with time. The impending loss of a generation of elders like her is stated very directly in the opening intertitle of the short film, uh, which reads, and when they're gone, who will tell their stories? And I think the implication is that these guys will tell their stories, particularly John um, Foster's character, who at one point says he has a three-year-old daughter, and we see Sterling Harjo's three-year-old daughter in the film. And so that's sort of Sterling Harjo, and he's between a younger and an elder generation in the, the staging of the, of the scene. Harjo signals the settler colonial markers of time, the imposition of Western timekeeping through clocks, and the institutionalized suspension of time through coerced waiting, that closely controlled inactivity to which waiting rooms are devoted by returning frequently to clocks as the hours tick by. With a little shot. Um, yeah. I think I had a little added something to it. Yeah, Harjo's waiting room setting is resonant with themes of complex and loving community care versus the inadequacies, inadequacies, deliberate inadequacies of imposed state care, and also with settler colonial temporality as enclosure. Just as Michelle Raheja describes the film screen as a virtual reservation, Harjo's waiting room comprises a spatially and especially a temporal enclosure that stands in for uh, his reservation as well. Uh, the nation gathered within it is a composite of his, com of his community, while its boundaries are also transacted and enforced by the colonizer's paperwork. Yet it is also a place where generations come together and care for one another. Harjo also both contrasts and merges settler colonial clock time with kinship time then, reminding viewers of our short time left with our elders reminding us of continuity across generations, and reminding us of indigenous pasts and futures in relationship through, for example, a shot, for, a shot, versus, a shot reverse shot of Irene exchanging glances with a young child. One more. Uh, contiguous close-ups of Irene uh, and of a clock across an edit, and a superimposition across a dissolve from that clock to the community, the faces of all the Seminole and Muscogee people gathered in the waiting room. We learn later that Irene's own daughter has died, as has her husband. She's both alone in the world and embedded in it as a grandmother. Goodnight Irene's quiet storytelling holds its own, but there is more direct political content, too. In an early scene, a young man, played by John Proudstar, who I was indicating earlier, checks in with a bloody nose, with a close-up depicting drops of blood falling on the paper forms he needs to sign to get into the clinic. There's four slides, one, two, three, and four. Later in the film, another patient must produce his CDIB card, the federally issued certificate of degree of Indian blood. And Irene shares how she destroyed her own card in defiance of US attempts to, attempts to adjudicate indigenous identity. Uh, the young man who's wearing an army shirt um, is impressed. So he cuts his own card into thirds and gives each seatmate a piece of the card. And I think there's three shots there. And one more. If you go back to me, that says Sterling Harjo. It's his own card, by the way, that he's cutting up. He was committed. OK. Um, it is both a traditional act of sharing and a powerful political rebuke to blood quantum regimes, uh, which are here interpreted as a racialization and bureaucratization of indigenous identity and as a form of diminishment aimed at the elimination of indigenous nations. Indeed, Irene comments contemptuously that if the young man doesn't have his card, that, quote, that means you don't exist. 
I burned mine, she adds quietly. In an echo of the statement about vanishing in the film's final shot, Irene walks slowly down the IHS hallway, knowing she may never leave the hospital. There's two shots there. One, two. The character of Irene is reintroduced in 2021 in the first season, second episode of Reservation Dogs, which again takes place in the waiting room of the Indian Health Service. The episode picks up where Goodnight Irene left off. Irene is in a hospital bed, and the character, Cheese, Lane Factor, uh, walks past. She hails him as her grandson, although they have never met, and convinces him to help her leave the hospital for home. I think there's about five shots of that sequence. One, two, three. One more. Yeah. In addition to the waiting room setting, there are also moments of shot for shot reprise of Goodnight Irene, notably a shot of several drops of blood on paper forms. As the lead character, Bear Small Hill, played by Defero Lunatai, tries to get treatment for his bloody nose and encounters the salty IHS receptionist, Bev, here played by the incomparable Lakota performer, Jana Schmieding, star of the concurrent series, Rutherford Falls for Peacock TV. There's a series of shots here. Okay. <laughs> One more. And yeah. Harjo's style is peppered with homages and shout outs, but Rai returned to his own work in this way, not just to the IHS waiting room, but to this precise close insert of drops of blood on the page from his first short almost 20 years earlier. One more. Mm. Oh, yeah. One more. One more. I think I have a lot of slides here. One more. One more. Yeah. <laughs> now we're caught up. Certainly it calls to mind treaties and the violence surrounding them. I don't think it's indicating a specific uh, treaty, but more broadly the violence of federal bureaucracy, I think. Uh, these reprises are different from other of his homages. The IHS waiting room is a profoundly personal space, I think, for Harjo. The child exchanging glances with Irene in the opening that I showed you is Harjo's own young daughter, uh, Portland Harjo, at, eight, at about age three. The CDIB card, the young man cuts apart and shares his Harjo's own card. The CDIB card, I don't have to tell this audience, pinpoints an indigenous individual within a regime of blood quantum in a racial politics or racial fiction that is the converse of the Southern one drop rule, but within a similar style or system of uh, fragmentation. It posits indigenous bodies as always already fragmented into separable pieces. The CDIB card dictates this division of an individual into pieces, imposing US regulation of ind indigenous identity, even, to, uh, even out of existence through intermarriage. So Irene asserts that without that card, quote, you don't exist. But with the card, there is also a foreclosed, or better put here, enclosed, future for indigenous nations. Harjo's images of the recurring drops of blood on Indian Health Service paperwork call out and critique the system through subtle reprise, turning strategies of fragmentation back onto the settler or colonial state and into a tactic of kinship building. By cutting up his CDIB card in Goodnight Irene, and especially by giving away the pieces, the young man, a nameless representative of the next generation, demonstrates what he has learned from Irene. Indigenous kinship expressed through practices of sharing and mutual care transcends the control of the state. Indeed, indigenous kinship as a form of relationality distinct from blood quantum represents indigenous continuity, returning to a conception of time as an ongoing spiral. Irene's activism is to activate kinship time as indigenous resistance and futurism. In another sovereignist thread, Harjo returns to the character of Irene, again played by Camp Horanak in his second feature film, Barking Water. Irene springs her former lover, Frankie, played by Richard Ray Whiteman, who also plays Old Man Fixico in Reservation Dogs. There's a shot of him, I think. Um, from the IHS hospital. Frankie wants to die at home, reunited with his daughter, rather than alone in the hospital. And the story follows their road trip through Oklahoma's Indian country towards home, with stops along the way. Harjo's visionary eye for his indigenous community's older generations expands screen forms to center indigenous elders as lead characters in genres and themes that so often center white people, young people, such as love stories and road movies. Relationships unfold already freighted with a deep past. Here, Irene and Frankie's story forms a kind of feature-length flashback or backstory to Goodnight Irene. 
fraught with community pasts, long family relations, and world building. The road itself, we are reminded, is built on what was already, what has always been, indigenous territory. In this scene, Irene interrupts Frankie's longing for land with an assertion that indeed they are already on their own land. If you go forward and there's a clip so you can press play. So saying you don't have to play the settler colonial game of waiting, right? <laughs> of waiting and saving and buying. It's, it's, it's right now, the, the present moment. It, you know, we are here, it's ours. Indigenous land rights and the current presence of indigenous peoples on the land, she is saying, exceed the paper regimes of ownership. Those same regimes that decimated indigenous lands through treaties and their abrogation, through the allotment system, through Oklahoma's notoriously rampant fraud, divesting indigenous peoples of their land and their rights and self-definition and self-determination. Irene's message confronts US attempts to legislate the composition of indigenous bodies on, in paper discourses of blood quantum and private property, asserting instead the power of indigenous nationhood built not from the individual, much less modular fragments of an individual, but rather from the collective, the seminal as a people. Cheese's relationship, you can go to the next slide, um, with Irene, oops, can move forward. There you go. Cheese's relationship with Irene in episode two of Reservation Dogs is characterized by kinship address. She calls him grandson, despite not being related by blood, and he graciously accepts and eventually returns this relational address and its reciprocal obligations of ongoing care and connection. One more shot. The larger kinship networks of intergenerational belonging that characterize so many rural indigenous communities are explored here with humor and with immense affection. Everyone on the reservation is your cousin, all the elder women are your auntie or your grandma. Harja's many stories are one story, composed of many moments of reprise across casting and character storylines, visual aesthetics, and off-screen social relations and practices. These overlaps, recurrences, and continuities across productions reveal a heartbeat of indigenous sovereignty and activism carried forward not solely by Reservation Dog's young leads, but also by Harjo's recurring elders, and centrally by Casey Kampornek's co-creation of the seminal elder Irene. Muscogee people tell a creation story about how Turtle once had a beautiful smooth shell, but became conceited and bothered Muscogee women who don't take any nonsense. They smashed his shell into pieces with a corn pounder, corn pounder and Turtle had to seek help from ants to put the pieces back together. Muscogee scholar Laura Harjo refers to the story when she talks about Muscogee revitalization as a process of singing the pieces back together. Indeed, Sterling Harjo is assembling the many stories of his community into a powerful and loving tapestry. Thank you. <laughs>